So I'm going to read to you a chapter from The Invisible Bridge. And before I do, I wanted to tell you a couple of other things about the book, uh, because the chapter I'm going to be reading is a little ways in. And so I just wanted to set things up for you by um, telling you that the book begins with uh, our young protagonist, Andras Levy, um, just about to embark for Paris um, on a scholarship to the École Spéciale d'Architecture. And uh, when we meet him, he is, um, he's with his older brother, and he's, he's about to, uh, to step off into the void. So in fact, maybe I'll read you, I'll read you the first couple of pages just to, just to set things up, just so you can begin to get a flavor for it and, and for what's going on. And then I'll tell you a little bit about what happens between there and the chapter that I'm going to read. So this is from the beginning, in fact. This is chapter one, a letter. Later, he would tell her that their story began at the Royal Hungarian Opera House the night before he left for Paris on the Western Europe Express. The year was 1937. The month was September, the evening unseasonably cold. His brother had insisted on taking him to the opera as a parting gift. The show was Tosca, and their seats were at the top of the house. Not for them the three marble-arched doorways, the facade with its Corinthian columns and heroic entablature. Theirs was a humble side entrance with a red-faced ticket taker, a floor of scuffed wood, walls plastered with crumbling opera posters. Girls in knee-length dresses climbed the stairs arm in arm with young men in threadbare suits. Pensioners argued with their white-haired wives as they shuffled up the five narrow flights. At the top, a joyful din, a refreshment salon lined with mirrors and wooden benches, the air hazy with cigarette smoke. A doorway at its far end opened onto the concert hall itself, the great electric lit cavern of it, with its ceiling fresco of Greek immortals and its gold scrolled tears. Andras had never expected to see an opera here, nor would he have if Tibor hadn't bought the tickets. But it was Tibor's opinion that residents in Budapest must include at least one evening of Puccini at the opera house. Now Tibor leaned over the rail to point out Admiral Horthy's box, empty that night except for an ancient general in a hussar's jacket. Far below, tuxedoed ushers led men and women to their seats, the men in evening dress, the women's hair glittering with jewels. If only Matyash could see this, Andras said. He'll see it, Andraska. He'll come to Budapest when he's got his baccalaureate, and in a year he'll be sick to death of this place. Andras had to smile. He and Tibor had both moved to Budapest as soon as they graduated from gymnasium in Debrecen. They had all grown up in Konyar, a tiny village in the eastern flatlands, and to them, too, the capital city had once seemed like the center of the world. Now Tibor had plans to go to medical college in Italy, and Andras, who had lived there for only a year, had lived here for only a year, was leaving for school in Paris. Until the news from the École Spéciale d'Architecture, they had all thought Tibor would be the first to go. For the past three years, he'd been working as a sales clerk in a shoe store on Vatsu Utsa, saving money for his tuition and poring over his medical textbooks at night as desperately as if he were trying to save his own life. When Andras had moved in with him a year earlier, Tibor's departure had seemed imminent. He had already passed his exams and submitted his application to medical school in Modena. He thought it might take six months to get his acceptance and student visa. Instead, the medical college had placed him on a waiting list for foreign students, and he'd been told it might be another year or two before he could matriculate. Tibor hadn't said a word about his own situation since Andras had learned of his scholarship, nor had he shown a trace of envy. Instead, he had bought these opera tickets and helped Andras make his plans. Now, as the lights dimmed and the orchestra began to tune, Andras was visited by a private shame. Though he knew he would have been happy for Tibor if their situations had been reversed, he suspected he would have done a poor job of hiding his jealousy. So, that's the situation, essentially. Um, Andras goes off to Paris. He begins school at the École Spéciale. And within a very short time, just a, a few weeks of being there, really, he learns that he loses his scholarship. And this is because the Hungarian government has passed a regulation that prohibits uh, money from being sent to Jewish students abroad. And so the organization that has provided his scholarship can no longer provide it. Um, so he faces being kicked out of school because he can't pay the tuition. Uh, and what he has to do is get a job. So he contacts this man he met on the train, 
uh, who runs the Sarah Bernhardt Theater in Paris, and he applies to him a number of times and finally convinces him to employ him. Uh, he employs him as a, uh, a kind of a gopher. Uh, he runs around and does errands for everyone in the theater, all the actors and the stage managers and the directors. Um, and um, and uh, he meets an actress there, uh, Madame Gerard, who wants to kind of set him up a little bit in Paris with some friends. And so, um, so she sets up a luncheon for him um, at the home of one of her friends. Um, and the purpose of this is for Andras to meet this woman's 16-year-old uh, daughter. And um, the idea is that th these two might get along and perhaps have a romantic connection. So Andras is very excited about this. He, uh, he has the costume designer at the theater um, put together something that looks like what a you know, nice, upstanding young man might wear to a luncheon, a kind of tie that even though it's silk on the front, it's you know, cotton on the back, but no one will ever see. And you know, a white shirt that was used for a costume um, earlier in one of the, the other plays. So he looks like a nice, upstanding young man, and he arrives with this huge armload of, of flowers that he's taken from the theater, and they'll appear in, in the piece. Um, but anyways, this is, uh, this is the chapter in which he goes to have lunch at these people's house, uh, the Morgan Stearns, um, and um, to meet this, this young woman, um, Elizabeth. Um, the other thing that you should know um, before I begin to read this chapter is that when, just before Andras left Budapest, he was approached by um, a woman who was at the opera, who ran into him as he was on his way out, um, who also has a son who's studying architecture, or who's studying art in Paris at the time. She asked Andras to take a box of stuff for her kid, you know, um, clothes and food and things like that. And when he goes to her house to pick up this box of stuff, this woman's mother-in-law says, by the way, would you mind delivering this letter for me? Um, just take it to Paris by hand, drop it into a post box there. Um, and it's addressed to somebody called C. Morgenstern. Um, and when Andras gets the address of the place where he's supposed to have lunch, he sees that it's the same address to which this letter was to be mailed. And so there's this coincidence that's been animating his interest in this, this luncheon. Um, he's thinking, my god, I'm finally going to meet um, this person, this mysterious person who the letter went to, who um, my friend Joseph's mother, uh, grandmother rather, um, wanted to send this letter to, but had to send it by somebody's hand, didn't trust the post to send it. So, um, so there's this mystery underneath um, the event as well. So this, is, uh, this chapter is called A Luncheon. It had been only a few weeks since Andras had studied the architecture of the Marais with Perret's class. They had taken a special trip to see the Hôtel de Seine, the 15th century city palace with its turrets and leonine gargoyles, its confusion of roof lines, its cramped and cluttered façade. Andras had expected Perret's lecture to be a stern critique, a disquisition on the virtues of simplicity. But the lesson had been about the strength of the building, the fine craftsmanship that had allowed it to endure. Perret moved his hand along the stonework of the front entrance showing the students what care the masons had taken in cutting the voussoir of the Gothic arches. As he spoke, a pair of Orthodox men had appeared on the street, leading a group of schoolboys in yarmulkes. The two groups of students had stared at each other as they passed. The boys whispered to each other, looking, looking at Paré in his military cloak, a few lagged behind as if to hear what Paré might say next. One boy snapped a salute, and his teacher delivered a stern reprimand in Yiddish. Now Andras passed behind the Hôtel de Seine, past the manicured topiary gardens and the raised beds planted with purple kale for winter. Hefting his load of flowers, he sidestepped through the traffic on the Rue de Rivoli. In the Marais, the streets had an inside feel, almost as if they were part of a movie set. In Cinescope and Le Film Complet, Andras had seen the miniature cities built inside cavernous sound stages in Los Angeles. Here, the pale blue winter sky seemed like the arching roof of a studio, and Andras half expected to see men and women in medieval costume moving between the buildings, trailed by megaphone-wielding directors, by cameramen with their rafts of complicated equipment. There were kosher butchers and Hebrew bookshops and synagogues, all of them with signs written in Yiddish, as though this were a different country within the city. But there was no anti-Semitic graffiti of the kind that regularly appeared in the Jewish quarter in Budapest. 
Instead, the walls were bare or plastered with advertisements for soap or chocolate or cigarettes. As Andras entered the tall corridor of the Rue de Sevigny, a black taxi roared past, nearly knocking him off his feet. He steadied himself, shifted his vast bouquet from one arm to the other, and checked the address on the card Madame Gerard had given him. Across the street, he could see a windowed shop front with a wooden sign cut into the form of a child ballerina, and beneath it the legend, École de Ballet, Madame Morgenstern, maîtresse. He crossed the street. A set of demi-curtain windows ran along both sides of the corner building. And when he stood on his toes, he could see an empty room with a floor of yellow wood. One wall was lined from end to end with mirrors. Polished wooden practice bars ran along the others. A squat upright piano crouched in one corner, and beside it stood a table with an old-fashioned gramophone, its glossy black morning glory horn catching the light. A diffuse haze of dust motes hovered in the midday silence. Some remnant of movement, of music, seemed revealed in that tourbillon of dust, as if ballet continued to exist in that room, whether a class was being conducted there or not. The building entrance was a green door set with a leaded glass window. Andras rang the bell and waited. Through the sheer panel that covered the window, he could see a stout woman descending a flight of stairs. She opened the door and put a hand on her hip, giving him an appraising look. She was red-faced, kerchiefed, with a deep smell of paprika about her, like the woman who bought vegetables and goat's milk to sell at the market in Debrecen. Madame Morgenstern, he said with hesitation. She didn't look much like a ballet mistress. Ha, no, she said in Hungarian. Come in and close the door behind you. You'll let in the cold. So he must have passed her inspection. He was glad because the smells coming from inside were making him dizzy with hunger. He stepped into the entry, and the woman continued in a rapid stream of Hungarian as she took his coat and hat. What an enormous lot of flowers. She would see if there was a vase upstairs large enough to hold them. Lunch was nearly ready. She had prepared stuffed cabbage, and she hoped he liked it because there was nothing else except for spetzel and a fruit compote and some sliced cold chicken and a walnut strudel. He should follow her upstairs. Her name was Mrs. Apfel. They climbed to the second floor where she directed him to a front parlor decorated with worn Turkish rugs and dark furniture. She told him to wait there for Madame Morgenstern. He sat on a gray velvet settee and took a long breath. Beneath the heady smell of stuffed cabbage, there was a dry, lemony tang of furniture polish and a faint scent of licorice. On a small carved table before him was a candy dish, a cut glass nest filled with pink and lilac sugar eggs. He took an egg and ate it. Anis. He straightened his tie and made sure the cotton backing wasn't showing. After a moment, he heard the click of heels in the hallway. A slim shadow moved across the wall, and a girl entered with a blue glass vase in her hands. The vase bristled with a wild profusion of flowers and branches and fake bluebirds, the day lilies beginning to darken at their edges, the roses hanging heavy on their stems. From behind this mass of fading blooms, the girl looked at Andras, her dark hair brushed like a wing across her forehead. Thank you for the flowers, she said in French. As she set the vase on the sideboard, he saw she wasn't a girl at all. Her features had the sharper angles of an adult woman's, and she held her back straight as if from decades of ballet training. But she was lithe and small, her hands like a child's on the blue glass vase. Andras drank in a flood of embarrassment as he watched her arrange the bouquet. Why had he brought so many half-dead flowers? Why the bluebirds? Why all those branches? Why hadn't he just bought something simple at the corner market? A dozen daisies, a sheaf of lupines. How much could it have cost? A couple of francs? The wood nymph smiled back at him over her shoulder, then came to shake his hand. Claire Morgenstern, she said. It's a pleasure to meet you at last, Mr. Levy. Madame Gerard has had many kind things to say about you. He took her hand, trying not to stare. She looked decades younger than he'd imagined. He'd envisioned her as a woman of Madame Gerard's age, but this woman couldn't have been more than 30. She had a quiet, astonishing beauty, fine bones, a mouth like a smooth pink-skinned fruit, large, intelligent gray eyes. Claire Morgenstern, so this was the C of the letter, not some elderly gentleman who had once been Mrs. Haas's lover. Her large gray eyes were Mrs. Haas's eyes, the quiet grief he saw there, a mirror of the expression he'd seen in the older woman's eyes. This Claire Morgenstern had to be Mrs. Haas's daughter. A long moment passed before Andras could speak. 
The pleasure to make your acquaintance, he said in rushed and stilted French, knowing he'd gotten it wrong as soon as he said it. Belatedly, he remembered to rise, though he struggled for the right words, found himself continuing in the same vein. Thank you for the invitation of me, he stammered, and sat down again. Madame Morgenstern took a seat beside him on a low chair. Would you rather speak Hungarian, she asked in Hungarian. We can, if you like. He looked up at her as if from the bottom of a well. French is fine, he said in Hungarian. And then in French again, French is fine. All right, then, she said. You'll have to tell me what Hungary is like these days. It's been years since I was there, and Elizabeth has never been. As if she'd been conjured by the mention of her name, a tall, stern-looking girl entered the room carrying a pitcher of iced tea. She was broad-shouldered like the swimmers Andras had admired at Palatina Strand in Budapest. She gave him a look of impatient disdain as she filled his glass. This is my Elizabeth, said Madame Morgenstern. Elizabeth, this is Andras. Andras couldn't make himself believe that this girl was Madame Morgenstern's daughter. In Elizabeth's hands, the tea pitcher looked like a child's toy. He drank his tea and looked from mother to daughter. Madame Morgenstern stirred her tea with a long spoon while Elizabeth, having set the pitcher on a table, threw herself into a wing chair and checked her wristwatch. If we don't eat now, I'll be late for the movie, she said. I'm supposed to meet Mart in an hour. What movie, Andras said, searching for a thread of conversation. You wouldn't be interested, Elizabeth said. It's in French. But I speak French, Andras said. Elizabeth gave him a dry smile. Mais je parle français, she said. Madame Morgenstern closed her eyes. Elizabeth, she said. What? You know what. I just want to go to the movies, Elizabeth said, and knocked her, kneels dully, knock, knocked her heels dully against the rug. Then she tilted her chin toward Andras and said, lovely tie. Andras looked down. His tie had flipped over as he leaned forward to take his glass of tea and now the cotton backing faced the world while the gold partridges flew unseen against his shirt front. Hot with shame, he turned it around and stared into his tea. Lunch is served, said the red-faced Mrs. Apfel from the doorway, pushing back her kerchief. Come now before the cabbage gets cold. There was a proper dining room with polished wooden china cabinets and a white cloth on the table, echoes of the house on Bensor Utsa, Andras thought. But there were no exsanguinated sandwiches, sandwiches here. The table was heavy with platters of stuffed cabbage and chicken and bowls of spetzel, as though there were eight of them eating instead of three. Madame Morgenstern sat at the head of the table, Andras and Elizabeth across from each other. Mrs. Apfel served the stuffed cabbage and spetzel. Andras, grateful for the distraction, tucked his napkin into his collar and began to eat. Elizabeth frowned at her plate. She pushed the cabbage aside and began eating the spetzel, one tiny dumpling at a time. I hear you're interested in mathematics, Andras said, speaking to the top of Elizabeth's lowered head. She raised her eyes. Did my mother tell you that? No, Madame Gerard did. She said you won a competition. Anyone can do high school mathematics. Do you think you'll want to study it in college? Elizabeth shrugged. If I go to college. Darling, you can't live on spetzel, Madame Morgenstern said quietly, looking at Elizabeth's plate. You used to like stuffed cabbage. It's cruel to eat meat, Elizabeth said, and leveled her eyes at Andras. I've seen how they butcher cows. They stick a knife in the neck and draw it downwards like this, and the blood pours out. My biology class took a trip to a shochet. It's barbaric. Not really, Andras said. My brothers and I used to know the kosher butcher in our town. He was a friend of our father's, and he was quite gentle with the animals. Elizabeth watched him intently. And can you explain to me how you gently butcher a cow, she said? What did he do, pet them to death? He used the traditional method, Andras said, his tone sharper than he'd intended. One quick cut across the neck. I felt that way too at times, Andras said. I've spent a lot of time lately struggling to be French. Your French is excellent, as it turns out. No, it's terrible, and I'm afraid I did nothing to dispel your daughter's notion that my daughters are barbarians. Madame Morgenstern hid a smile behind her hand. You were rather quick with that business about the butcher, she said. I'm sorry, Andras said, but he started to laugh. I don't think I've ever spoken about that over lunch. So you really did know the butcher in your town, she said. I did, and I saw him at his work, but Elizabeth was right, I'm afraid. It was awful. You must have grown up where? Somewhere in the countryside? 
Cognac, he said, near Debrecen. Cognac? That's not 20 kilometers from Cabo, where my mother was born. A shade passed over her features and was gone. Your mother, he said. But she doesn't live there anymore? No, Madame Morgenstern said. She lives in Budapest. She fell silent for a moment, then turned the conversation back to Andras's history. So you're a Haidu, too, a flatlands boy. That's right, he said. My father owns a lumber yard in Kenya. So she wouldn't talk about it, wouldn't discuss the subject of her family. He had been on the verge of mentioning the letter, of saying, I've met your mother. But the moment had passed now, and there was a kind of relief in the prospect of talking about Konya. Ever since he'd arrived in Paris and had mastered enough French to answer questions about his origins, he'd been telling people he was from Budapest. What would anyone have known of Konya? And to those who would have known, like Joseph Haas or Pierre Vago, Konya meant a small and backward place, a town you were lucky to have escaped. Even the name sounded ridiculous, the punchline of a body joke the sound of a jumping jack springing from a box. But really, he was from Cognac, from that dirt-floored house beside the railroad tracks. My father's something of a celebrity in town, to tell the truth, Andrash said. Indeed, what is he known for? His terrible luck, Andrash said. And then, feeling suddenly brave, shall I tell you his story the way they tell it at home? By all means, she said, and folded her hands in anticipation. So he told her the story just as he'd always heard it. Before his father had owned the lumber yard, he had suffered a string of misfortunes that had earned him the nickname of Lucky Bela. His own father had fallen ill while Bela was at rabbinical school in Prague and had died as soon as he returned home. The vineyard he had inherited had succumbed to blight. His first wife had died in childbirth along with the baby, a girl. Not long after, his house had burned to the ground. All three of his brothers were killed in the Great War, and his mother had given in to grief and drowned herself in the Tisa. At 30, he was a ruined man, penniless, his family dead. For a time, he lived on the charity of the Jews of Konya, sleeping in the Orthodox shul at night and eating what they left for him. Then, at the end of a drought summer, a famous Ukrainian miracle rabbi arrived from across the border and set up temporary quarters in the shul. He studied Torah with the local men, settled disputes, officiated at weddings, granted divorces, prayed for rain, danced in the courtyard with his disciples. One morning at dawn, he came upon Andrash's father sleeping in the sanctuary. He'd heard the story of this unfortunate, this man whom all the village said must be suffering from a curse. They seemed to regard him with a kind of gratitude, as if he'd drawn the attention of the evil eye away from the rest of them. The rabbi roused Bela with a benediction, and Bela looked up in speechless fear. The rabbi was a gaunt man with an ice-white beard. His eyebrows stood out from the curve of his forehead like lifted wings, his eyes dark and liquid beneath him. Listen to me, Bela Levi, the rabbi whispered in the half-light of the sanctuary. There's nothing wrong with you. God asks the most of those he loves best. You must fast for two days and then go to the ritual bath, then accept the first offer of work you receive. Even if lucky Bela had been a believer in miracles, his misfortunes would have made him a skeptic. I'm too hungry to fast, he said. Practice at hunger makes the fast easier, the rabbi said. How do you know there's not a curse on me? I try not to wonder how I know. Certain things I just know. And the rabbi made another blessing over Bela and left him alone in the sanctuary. What more did lucky Bela have to lose? He fasted for two days and bathed in the river at night. The next morning he wandered toward the railroad tracks faint with hunger and picked an apple from a stunted tree beside a white brick cottage. The proprietor of the lumber yard, an Orthodox Jew, stepped out of the cottage and asked Bela what he thought he was doing. I used to have a vineyard, Bela said. When I had a vineyard, I would have let you pick my grapes. When I had a house, I would have welcomed you to my house. My wife would have given you something to eat. Now I have neither grapes nor house. I have no wife. I have no food. But I can work. There's no work here for you, the man said gently, but come inside and eat. The man's name was Zingo Kong. His wife, Gita, set bread and cheese before Lucky Bela. With Zingo and Gita and their five small children, Lucky Bela ate. As he did, he allowed himself to imagine for the first time that the rest of his life might not be shaped by the misery of his past. He couldn't have imagined that this house would become his own house that his own children would eat bread and cheese at this very table. 
But by the end of the afternoon, he had a job. The boy who worked the mechanical saw at Zindel Kohn's lumber yard had decided to become a disciple of the Ukrainian rabbi. He had left that morning without notice. Six years later, when Zindel Kohn and his family moved to Debertson, Lucky Bela took over the lumber yard. He married a black-haired girl named Flora, who bore him three sons, and by the time the oldest son was 10, Bela had earned enough money to buy the lumber yard outright. He did a fine business. People in Konyar needed building materials and firewood in every season. Before long, hardly anyone in Konyar remembered that Lucky Bela's nickname had been given in irony. The history might have been allowed to fade altogether had it not been for the return of the Ukrainian rabbi. This was at the height of the worldwide depression just before the high holidays. The rabbi spent an evening at Lucky Bela's house and asked if he might tell his story in synagogue. It might help the Jews of Konyar, he said, to be reminded of what God would do for his children if they refused to capitulate to despair. Lucky Bela consented. The rabbi told the story and the Jews of Konyar listened. Though Bela insisted his good fortune was due entirely to the generosity of others, people began to regard him as a kind of holy figure. They touched his house for good luck when they passed and asked him to be godfather to their children. Everyone believed he had a connection to the divine. You must have thought so yourself as a child, Madame Morgenstern said. I did. I thought he was invincible, even more so than most children think of their parents, Andrash said. Sometimes I wish I'd never lost the illusion. Ah, yes, she said. I understand. My parents are getting older, Andrash said. I hate to think of them alone in Konya. My father had pneumonia last year and couldn't work for a month afterward. He hadn't spoken about this to anyone in Paris. My younger brother's at school a few hours away, but he's caught up in his own life. And now my older brother's leaving, going off to medical school in Italy. A shadow came to Madame Morgenstern's features again, as if she'd experienced an inward twist of pain. My mother's getting older too, she said. It's been a long time since I've seen her. A very long time. She fell silent and glanced away from the table at the tall west-facing windows. The late autumn light fell in a diagonal plane across her face, illuminating the tapered curve of her mouth. Forgive me, she said, trying to smile. He offered his handkerchief, and she pressed it to her eyes. He found himself fighting the impulse to touch her, to trace a line from her nape down the curve of her back. Perhaps I've stayed too long, he said. No, please, she said. You haven't even had dessert. As if she'd been listening just beyond the dining room door, Mrs. Apfel came in at that moment to serve the walnut strudel. Andrash found that he had an appetite again. He was ravenous, in fact. He ate three slices of strudel and drank coffee with cream. As he did, he told Madame Morgenstern about his studies, about Professor Vago, about the trip to boulogne billancourt He found her easier to talk to than Madame Gerard. She had a way of pausing in quiet thought before she responded. She would pull her lips in pensively, and when she spoke, her voice was low and encouraging. After lunch, they went back to the parlor and looked through her album of picture postcards. Her dancer friends had traveled as far as Chicago and Cairo. There was even a hand-colored postcard from Africa. Three animals that looked like deer, but were slighter and more graceful, with straight, upcurved horns and almond-shaped eyes. The French word for them was gazelle. Gazelle, Andrash said, I'll try to remember. Yes, try, she said and smiled. Next time, I'll test you. When the afternoon light had begun to wane, she rose and led Andrash to the hallway where his coat and hat hung on a polished stand. She gave him his things and returned his handkerchief. As she led him down the stairs, she pointed out the photographs on the wall, images of students from years past, girls in ethereal clouds of tulle or sylph-like draperies of silk, young dancers under the transient spell of costumes and makeup and stage lights. Their expressions were serious, their arms as pale and nude as the branches of winter trees. He wanted to stay and look. He wondered if any of the photographs were of Madame Morgenstern herself when she was a child. Thank you for everything, he said when they reached the bottom of the stairs. Please, she put a slim hand on his arm. I should thank you. You were very kind to stay. Andrash flushed so deeply at the pressure of her hand that he could feel the blood beating in his temples. She opened the door and he stepped out into the chill of the afternoon. He found he couldn't look at her to say goodbye. Next time, I'll test you. But she'd return his handkerchief as though their paths were unlikely to cross again. He spoke his goodbye to the doorstep, to her feet in their fawn-colored shoes. 
Then he turned away and she closed the door behind him. Without thinking, he retraced his steps toward the river until he had reached the Pont Marie. There he paused at the edge of the bridge and brought out the handkerchief. It was still damp where she'd used it to dry his, her eyes. As if in a dream, he put a corner of it into his mouth and tasted the salt she'd left there. I'll stop there. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I think that, that when I read this chapter, one of the things I think about is how little I knew about what was going to happen in the rest of the book when I was writing this chapter. Um, I had some, some idea that, uh, well, first of all, when I began writing this chapter, I really didn't know that Andras was going to fall for Elizabeth's mother. It surprised me to discover that, in fact, she was the more intriguing of the, the two women of the household. Um, and, uh, and so that was one thing. And, and then it was only later that I realized that, that, the, that there should be a connection between the person who Andras meets in Budapest before he leaves and this woman he encounters in Paris. And it seemed entirely plausible that that would be the case because you know, Paris had a close-knit Hungarian expatriate community. And so it might well be that you know, different parts of it would intersect. Um, then there are other issues that, that arise here. The, um, the story of Andras's father, which originally appeared much closer to the beginning of the book, but then seemed more appropriately told in this chapter as a way for Andras and Madame Morgenstern to come to know each other. Um, and then there's the, the unspoken issue of how it happens that this woman who looks barely 30 years old has a 16-year-old daughter. Um, and that comes to be um, uh, something that we learn about more later in the book. Um, and so really, really, it, it was only in, in later drafts and the revisions that the chapter took the shape that it has now um, and included these other elements of the narrative that were going to come in um, as I discovered what the book was going to be and, and what the shape of the book was going to be and how the characters were going to be important to one another. Um, what were the books that influenced me as I was writing this? I, I feel like I, I had to learn something about the complexity of building a novel from other quite long novels, um, some of which were contemporary and some of which were not. Um, the books that I was reading at the beginning of the genesis of this book were War and Peace um, and uh, George Eliot's Middlemarch. Um, and I, I felt very much like I wanted to, um, to capture something of the expansiveness and the complexity and the moment by moment realism of the 19th century novel. But I also wanted to do so in a way that acknowledged what had happened in literature between the 19th century and now. And so as I was writing the book, I was also reading um, works by novelists, contemporary novelists, who I knew admired the 19th century novel, like Jeff Eugenides and his wonderful book, Middlesex, which in its title um, sort of makes a bow to Middlemarch. Um, and um, and uh, Michael Shabon's The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, um, and other books that were, that, that allowed themselves to be expansive while still maintaining the kind of, um, I don't know, the. Uh, harder eye that, that we turn towards literature now um, in the 20th and 21st century. Yes? Um, what's your, ed like your personal editing process like? like? You said that what most of what this chapter you just read um, came in later drafts. Mm -hmm. Was that, um, With that, did, did you know consciously make decisions about what it was going to be like? You said you know you found that mother was the most interesting character, but mm -hmm. how did you like self edit? Yeah, um, the, that was very difficult. In fact, um, with a novel, much more so than with short stories, simply because um, because of the length and the scope of the work. And in fact, it took about three years to complete a draft of this book. And as I was writing the draft. I just didn't look back. Um, I went to this wonderful reading in San Francisco a number of years ago where Charles Baxter, who's a writer I really admire, was talking about 
how he had managed to complete a novel himself, and he gave a great piece of advice, which was, you know, don't begin editing before you finish the first draft because you don't know which parts are going to end up being important. You don't know um, whether you're spending your time on something that you're going to later end up cutting out. And so the first draft of this book was about a thousand pages long um, and contained a lot of false turns that I had then abandoned. Um, and um, so the first time I actually went back and reread the whole thing, and saw how many places I was going to have to, you know, excise, you know, 50 or 100 pages, and how much editing all the rest of it was going to need. I just, I just broke down in tears. I just thought, there's no way. I just can't do this. I just thought of how many times longer it was in my short story collection, and just thought, I should just, just hang it up right now. I should just toss it into the river and be done with it. Um, but in <coughs> fact, there is one thing that's easier about editing a novel than editing a collection of short stories, which is that the novel is one piece, whereas the short story collection is all of these disparate pieces. Um, and so I discovered that once I actually went back to the beginning and began cutting and began reshaping, um, I could do so along the continuum of the book. And that really was another thing that was important about uh, the editing process, that I always went from beginning to end as I was editing the book. Because um, I felt like otherwise it would be very difficult to maintain a sense of the narrative momentum um, and, and a clear enough memory of how one detail led into the next. Um, and quite late in the process, that wasn't true any longer. You know, when I was dealing with very, very small things, I could sort of move around within the, in the text. But in the major revisions, and there were quite a few of them, you know, maybe five or six really major revisions. Um, I, I went from beginning to end, um, and, and that was very helpful. Yes? Uh, Julie, I just wanted to ask, where, where did the inspiration come from to focus on a, a, on a Hungarian student entering Paris in the 30s? I mean, like some of your short story, called, you know, in from How to Breathe Other Water are about, you know, Louisiana or, you know, the pool or how did, how did you focus in on that particular time period and that particular journey? Well, you know, when we're first learning how to write, one of the things that um, we're encouraged to do is to um, look into our own experience. Um, and so I think for the first collection of short stories, um, I enjoyed sort of pulling from some experiences that were a bit closer to my own. I grew up in New Orleans and in Michigan, and some of the stories are set there. Um, and. Um, and I enjoyed writing about childhood and adolescence. Um, but with this novel, I felt like I wanted to do something completely different. And um, it was a decision that came out of a story that I had begun to hear from my grandfather. My mother's side of the family is Hungarian and came here in 1956, in December of 1956, just after the, the failed revolution. Um, and I felt that once I had begun, I had begun to learn about what had happened to my grandfather before and during the war, um, his story seemed to take on the shape of a novel um, in my mind. And um, though the book departs almost immediately from his experience and then continues to do th so throughout its entirety, um, there are a number of experiences that are quite close to his. Um, he was, in fact, an architecture student in Paris. He did lose his scholarship. He, in fact, worked at the Sarah Bernhardt Theater. Um, and later on, he was a conscript into uh, the forced labor service, the Munka Solgala, um, in Hungary. Um, and so, um, so I spent a lot of time speaking to him and to his younger brother and to other members of our family about their experiences. Um, and I, I feel like it would have been, I feel like I would probably have not felt like I could even try to write a book that was so far from my own experience had it not been for the fact that there were still people around who I could actually speak to um, and ask questions of. When you, when you embark on, on writing a book about that, that takes place during those years and that concerns the Holocaust, one of the first things that, that people say to you, both well-meaning and not, is, uh, how could you write another book about the Holocaust? Um, and what I realized pretty early on was that, that I hadn't read a lot about the Holocaust in Hungary. Um, I didn't feel like it was a subject that had been covered very adequately in, in the English language. Um, the Holocaust was 
quite different for the Jews of Hungary in the sense that um, Hungary wasn't occupied until March of 1944. And so for quite a long time, um, the Jews of Hungary had a sense that they were going to be protected. They were going to be protected by the fact that their government was led by Miklos Horthy, who despite being somewhat of an anti-Semite and having passed quite stringent anti-Jewish laws, considered the Jews of Hungary to be a necessity to the country, considered them to be an economic and cultural necessity to the country. And though Horthy was a collaborator with Hitler, um, he, he was unwilling to um, concentrate and deport Hungary's Jews. Now, the news of the camps reached the Western world in 1942. Um, and stories about what was going on um, in Poland and Germany uh, were pretty widely known um, through the couple of years before Hungary was <coughs> occupied. Some of the stories were dismissed as, as outright fabrication because they were so horrific that nobody could believe that these things were actually going on. But some of the stories were believed and people were really quite scared. Um, one of the, the other things that was particular about um, the Holocaust in Hungary was that, that despite the fact that the Jewish press was very severely limited, almost every um, Jewish news organization was forced to close down, there was one newspaper that was allowed to con continue printing. One of the reasons that it was allowed to continue printing was so that, uh, that the news could be disseminated in a way that was not going to cause a panic among the Jewish population. So the Hungarian government allowed for this one paper to, to continue existing for, for this reason. Um, and due to the influence of that paper, um, to, to quite a large extent, people were not really aware of what was going on and were not as um, concerned as they, they should have been. Um, the yeah. Jewish leadership of Hungary knew exactly what was going on. They did, yes, of course. And they did not tell the Jewish people that's of Hungary that's, about that's it. That's exactly right. And that is a question that's never answered why they did not. Yes, that's right. So, in fact, this is an important clarification. The Jewish leadership of Hungary did, in fact, know, but there was a veil drawn over that information. And so the information that was actually being disseminated was not the information that these, that these people had. Um, why did that happen? There were a lot of different theories as to, as to um, what might have been motivating these people. Um, perhaps they felt that if there was an occupation, if they had collaborated in this particular way with the government, that they might be safer. Um, they also felt um, in the accounts that I've read that, in fact, an occupation was quite unlikely because by 1944, by the time the country was occupied, it was becoming pretty clear that there was no way for Hitler to win the war. Um, and so most people thought that the war was going to be over before an occupation could happen, and certainly before deportations could occur. Um, so despite the fact that that, that is one of the mysteries of, of the Holocaust in Hungary, um, there are a number of theories about, about why that gap of information occurred. It's a big mystery. It is, yeah. Um, so I'll search it out. The other, the other thing that was particularly devastating about the Holocaust in Hungary is the fact that because the country was occupied so late, the, the Nazi death machine was quite well developed by that time. And so once the deportations began in May of 1944, um, the the camps were so well established and the train lines were so well established and everything was, was so sort of tightly run that despite the fact that the deportations only occurred for a short period of time relatively, um, more than half of the Hungarian Jewish population was killed in that short period of time, um, 400,000 plus um, Jews were killed in, in this relatively short period of time. Um, and uh, the Jews of Budapest were the last to be deported um, and they had been hearing these horrific stories from the countryside about what was going on but in fact they you know they too were deported in the end um, and um, and it was because that that Nazi killing machine 
was had been in operation for such a long time by that point that they were that those deportations were as devastating as they were. Um, so uh, I could speak about this for a long time. Another thing that I think is just worth mentioning before I finish is that there were a number of um, of foreigners who came to Budapest. Um, during the siege, before and during the siege of Budapest, and saved a great many people because they knew what was going on already. And so, yeah, so um, there, you know, a, an entire novel could be written just about these experiences, and maybe that's something to consider for down the line. But um, <coughs> there, there were also a lot of, of acts of heroism, both by, by Jews and non Jews, during that time that saved a great many Jews as well. I really love the form of the short story, and I really hope to always write short stories, but um, I did feel, in a way, by the end of the process, <laughs> a lot more at home um, in the novel. Um, and I, I think it's because, uh, as opposed to the short story, which is so much more like walking into a room and, and inhabiting it fully, um, a novel is like walking into a number of lives and inhabiting them fully. And I, I feel like the novel is a form that allows you to do more fully that incredible thing that fiction does, which is to, um, to place you behind the eyes of another human being and allow you to see the world as they might see it. Um, and the same is true, I think, for the writer of a short st story versus the writer of a novel. I feel like like the novelist has a much deeper opportunity to come to know the characters and um, understand the characters' relationships and the characters' motivations and, and their fears and their hopes and their loves and their despairs. Um, and it's, um, it's an experience that I hope to have again as a writer. Um, and um, I'm working on another novel now, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Thank you very much.